All right, welcome everybody. We'll give it another couple seconds to let everyone trickle in here. Okay, hello everyone. All right, we'll get going here now that it's seven o'clock East Coast time. Um, welcome to our bi-weekly wilderness medicine lecture series hosted by GOMI, the Global Organization for Wilderness Medical Education. If this is your first time joining us, um, here's our mission. It's um, to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare providers can explore and interact with the really cool subfields within wilderness and emergency medicine. We aim to showcase the diverse spheres in which we can all make an impact and inspire others to think abstractly about the cool ways that we can enjoy our healthcare careers. And we hope that by doing this, we can create an international community uh, yeah. of okay. enthusiasts um, to uh, who are all interested in this really cool subfield of medicine. So um, I encourage you to join our mailing list if you haven't already. Um, you can stay up to date on our lecture series as well as many other opportunities and free giveaways, things like that. Definitely follow us on our socials, especially our YouTube channel, where most of our previous lectures have all been um, stored for you to watch at your um, at your leisure. This is our lineup for the spring. We're about halfway in. Um, this week, we are looking at endurance racing with Dr. Pasternak. Um, and we still have one, two, three, four more speakers and a fellowship showcase still waiting for us for the rest of the semester. So we've got a lot of cool talks lined up for you all. Hope to see you at most of them. Um, we did this. We started this last uh, semester. We're doing it again. Um, Pit Viper has agreed to give out free swag. Um, we're going to drop a link in the chat for you to put your name into a Google form um, at the end of the semester. Sometime in May, we will... Uh, draw one name and you will get entered into a drawing for something cool from Pit Viper. So that brings us to today's speaker, Dr. Andy Pasternak, graduated from the University of Michigan Intiflex program in 1993. After graduation, he moved to Madison for his family medicine residency. And after that, he did a primary care research fellowship at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He moved to Reno in 1998 and started um, at the Silver Sage Center for Family Medicine in 2005. Along with providing care for people in Northern Nevada, Silver Sage has donated over $200,000 to local environmental groups since January 2007 through its membership in a 1% for the Planet program. Dr. Pasternak is currently a community clinical professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, as well as a research director for the Sports Medicine Fellowship. He is also the medical director for the Tahoe Rim Trail Endurance Races and the Western States 100. Since 2012, he has been a board member of Access to Healthcare, which is a local nonprofit in Nevada. Yeah, no, you did that, right? You the should always turn into the left most of, uh, Make sure your mics are off, folks. Thank you. Um, has been a board member of, um, uh, whoops, shoot. Uh, Access to Healthcare, a local nonprofit in Nevada that improves the health and well being of individuals in our community by providing and expanding access to services that address the clinical and social determinants of health. Starting in 2022, he was named as associate editor for the Annals of Family Medicine. Finally, he was proud to serve as the 117th president of the Nevada State Medical Association. Uh, somehow, he still has free time with all that, and he enjoys trail running, bicycling, cross country skiing, and traveling with his lovely and talented wife. Dr. Joanne Alero. He also plays tuba in the Reno Schnitzel's Oompa Band, Jaboom Street Marching Band, and Truckee Tahoe Community Band. So Dr. Pasternak uh, seems to have quite the resume, and I'm very excited to hear more about his activities. So I, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Dr. Pasternak. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm uh, pretty excited about this talk. So let me uh, get to my right uh, slide set here. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to go to. Yeah. 
Uh, so yeah, so uh, again, thank you, thank you guys for having me. Um, I, you know, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience, uh, a little bit sort of, you know, what I heard it was we wanted to talk a little bit about how I got on this path to um, uh, to doing medical care for ultra marathons, um, and then you know, sort of career path wise, I know you guys are where you're at your training. It's always like, how do I get to do um, X. And so we'll talk a little bit about that at the start. And then I'll talk, uh, pri primarily about some of the, uh, medical issues that we see at ultra marathon. Some of my experiences, uh, we'll probably gloss over, uh, some of the stuff I have this probably about an hour and a half talk. So we're going to try to go quick. And then I do want to leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. Cause that's always the most fun part. So, uh, so how did I get here? Uh, so I grew up in suburban Detroit. I was not an athlete at all. Uh, I mean, I played a little bit of tennis. Uh, I was one of the worst track and field kids because I never trained. Excuse um, me, Dr. Pastrnak, actually, well, before, you, yep. before you get going, just so you know, you're on okay. slide 18 on my screen right now. Uh, I see. What is that? Yeah, so try hitting the play from start on the top left corner. Uh, hang on. The, uh, where, what am I, what are you seeing now? Right now I see it says key take home points. Okay. Uh, let me share a difference. Actually, I know what the problem might be. Actually, hang on. Oh, that's good. I see the 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 first okay. uh, slide now. All right. Oh, is that yeah, good? beautiful. I think I okay. think, right I think now. Thanks. Okay. I thank you. I yeah. I think I was sharing the wrong screen. So anyhow, um. So yeah. So I was not much of a high uh, athlete. I did go like as mentioned. I went to University uh, Michigan for undergrad med school. Go blue national championship. Still very happy. Uh, did my family medicine residency and then moved to uh, Reno, Nevada. And at some point in there, uh, my wife actually dragged me out to a 5K in the middle of Michigan and uh, got me running. And uh, when I was, it was actually when I was in residency and, and my fellowship that my wife and I started getting into running. So. Uh, yeah, so we started running, did a bunch of tr road runs, and um, and then uh, in 2005, um, we uh, hit our peak. We actually, I somehow qualified for Boston Marathon, and after that, I said, I don't want to run on the roads anymore, so started doing a lot of trail running, and Reno is just, it's a phenomenal area for trail running. Um, where we live, we go, we have about a quarter of a mile of pavement, and then we can literally run on the trails for hundreds and hundreds of miles. So, um, so I was sort of doing some ultra running. I'd done some some races, not a lot, but that had done a few. And in 2010, uh, the Tahoe Rim Trails Endurance Races, which is a it's a series of a, it's a 50k, 50 mile, 100 mile race. Um, they approached our sports medicine fellowship about. Uh, about having the sports medicine fellows be the medical director for the race and the poor sports medicine fellow at the time, you know, he started reading up about how to cover a marathon. So he's like, okay, we'll have medical aid stations every two miles of the course. Uh, really nice guy, but just had no idea of the uh, logistics of what it took uh, to run uh, to do medical for a, for a, a trail race and an, especially a hundred mile trail race and fairly, remote terrain. So I kind of got, I got involved with that. As a result of that, I started reaching out to Western states, got involved with Western states, uh, and ultimately became the, the medical director for Western states in two, uh, 2019. So I've been doing that for a few years. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it. This was not something I was ever planning on doing. I had no aspirations of becoming medical director for any of these races, you know, and I think one of the fun things with you guys is I remember being your age and you kind of have ideas of what you want to do with your life. Um, I think in some ways kind of the fun thing is you don't know where your careers are going to take you. And that's, that's actually kind of the great thing. Um, before I do start, I do want to thank um, a few people, uh, Dr. Tammy Hugh Butler, who we're going to mention a lot today. Uh, Dr. Bob Weiss, who was the previous um, uh, medical director for Western States. Uh, Marty Hoffman uh, had been the research director for Western States for a number of years and has done incredible things for ultra running. 
Um, uh, and, uh, I, I owe, I owe him a lot. He gave me a lot of help and mentorship and breaks. And then, um, I, I have this photo. This is, these are two of my good friends at the Tahoe Rim Race. Um, this is Mike Holmes, who's Mike's like the energizer bunny, but when he powers down, um, he is completely out. So this is, th these are the kind of hijinks that we have in the medical tent, uh, in aid station tents at three o'clock in the morning during an ultra. Mike was completely asleep had no idea my friend Jill was putting cups on him. And uh, we, we took photos, got him posted on Facebook and Instagram. And, and then he we got the cups off of him. He woke up and he's like, what was going on? And, you know, so it was, uh, that's that's kind of why we do it. It's, it's uh, covering these events is just a heck of a lot of fun. So uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is some of the medical issues we see. And again, we'll try to um, move through a lot of these things, but we're going to talk, talk about uh, hyponatremia, heat illness, talk about rhabdo and AKI, uh, acute kidney injury. That's one of the biggest things I've been focusing on lately. Talk a little bit about some of the stuff we've done with GI, blister care, uh, and then kind of assorted stuff. Um, this photo here, that's Jim Walmsley, who holds the course record at Western States with a time of, I think, 14.09, and his goal is to go under 14 hours this year. Um, so let's see if this works and I don't, if it does, uh, okay. Yeah, I was worried about this. That's all right. Um, yeah. So in the interest of time, I had a couple videos here. Um, if you get some time, you can just Google these on YouTube. I was hoping these were going to play. Let me see. No. Um, I knew that link wasn't going to work. Um, so anyhow, uh, you guys can Google these. This is, if you Google 2006 Western States, uh, Brian Morrison was actually leading the race with a time of just over 18 hours. Uh, and there's really dramatic photo of him crossing the finish line. Um, he was completely delirious. Uh, he actually got DQ'd from the race because his pacers actually kind of had to hold him up for the last uh, 100 yards. So I should back up. Western States 100 uh, is the oldest trail running, 100 mile trail running race in the in the world. Uh, and we just celebrated, depending on how you define it, it's, we just had our 50th anniversary, although there's some gray area of what our 50th is. Uh, and the race starts in, uh, at, uh, in Olympic Valley, California, which is where Palisade Ski Resort is, goes all over all these mountains and it ends on the track in Auburn, California. So this is actually the track in Auburn, um, and I knew this was, I thought this was going to work, but it's not going to work. Okay, um, if you get a chance, Google it, uh, dramatic finish, um, and then 2021 was actually one of my, uh, this was actually my first year, oh man, I wish these were working, um, this was my first year at Western States uh, as medical director, let me quickly oh i'm not gonna worry um again crazy finish um it, it's kind of hard to see but there's this guy in the blue right here uh you can kind of see if you look at the picture there's someone with the bass drum um who is was kind of annoying all of us frankly um uh, and uh we had a finish the guy in the blue is like completely he's got what we call the leans um he's completely leaning to one side kind of delirious um yeah, basically just makes it over the finish line um, and then kind of is completely out of it. Um, so these are kind of some of the things that we get to face uh, at the race. Um, so, if, yeah, if you guys get a chance, look at those finishes. Um, the, the, I, the, I will say the, the one of the really cool things about Western States is the um, – the energy, uh, we obviously, the, the crowd for the, for the top runners, is it's a good crowd. The crowd of the last hour, which is called the golden hour, so runners have a 30-hour uh, time cutoff to finish the race. And um, on Sunday morning in that last hour, um, every year we're getting a higher percentage of people finishing the race and seeing people – you know, meet their goal and finish in under 30 hours, sometimes by a matter of seconds, 
uh, the, the crowd is absolutely bonkers. There was a, a race, I think it was 17 or 18. We had a 70 year old woman, uh, finish the race with just literally seconds to spare. So if you guys get some time, um, it's, it's a, they're great videos to watch. If you ever get the chance to be in Auburn on race day, um, being there for the golden hour, that the, the, the crowds, it's, it's absolutely inspiring. Um, so I wanted to show these two runners because these are people that are delirious. They don't look good. They have mental status changes. Um, you know, one of them actually, uh, kind of collapsed during the race. The other guy, I mean, he literally, uh, from 2021, if you see the video, I mean, he literally, he gets to the finish line, kind of starts to cross the finish line, goes backwards. It's almost like a cartoon. And then he kind of leans forward and gets, it gets across there. So, when we see runners like this, we start thinking of a whole bunch of things. Um, usually if there's, if they're having mental status changes, if there's delirious, you're thinking you're more severe things. So hyponatremia is always really, really high at the, our list. Uh, things like cardiac arrest, heat stroke. Uh, there's some debate about heat stroke in, in ultra marathons, but I think given our, our conditions, we probably see that from time to time. Things like hypoglycemia, head injuries are things to, that we worry about. You know, we also see runners just collapse afterwards. They finish and they feel horrible and they collapse. Most commonly, that's just going to be exercise-associated collapse where they the blood is just pooling in their muscles and they stop perfusing their head. Um, and, you know, the, the treatment for that is just to get them, you know, lying down and get their legs up. Uh, sometimes severe muscle cramps will cause that. Um, uh, but this is kind of the list of things that we start worrying about. Um, and, you know, and so we go through a protocol with our runners, you know, again, one of the things we, you know, if someone finishes the run and they collapse, we worry a little bit less. If someone's actually running and they go down or if they have, you know, mental status changes, uh, they're delirious, uh, delusional, uh, we start worrying more about those things. Obviously, you're always going to get vitals. Uh, fortunately, at our races now, we can get uh, uh, blood, uh, we can get glucose levels, we can get sodium levels, we have eye stats. So if someone's really looking bad, we can get some numbers on them and kind of see where they're at. Um, so again, one of the biggest things we worry about is, is exercise is associated hyponatremia. Uh, as everybody knows, normal sodium levels, 135 to 145. Hyponatremia is, is anywhere is the sodium level less than 135. Um, really common condition, you know, if, if, if we're just going off a lab test, um, we'll see an incidence of up to about 50%. There's been at least 14 reported deaths of people dying of hyponatremia. And I think we've been doing a better job lately. Uh, we've been giving better recommendations, talking about treating to thirst. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the, the pathophysiology of hyponatremia. Uh, this is a photo of me. Uh, this is last year at Western States. Um, with uh, Jeff Curlin. He's been our uh, a, a medical captain at one of our, uh, he comes out from Pittsburgh to California every year. Uh, great guy. He's been coming out for, I think, 25 years now. And then uh, the woman in the middle is Dr. Tammy Hugh Butler, who's, uh, if you want to learn about exercise and, uh, associated hyponatremia, she is the the hyponatremia queen. You can follow her on Twitter. I think, I think she is hypo queen. Um, and she's a professor at Wayne State in Detroit um, and has just been a great resource for me and uh, is one of the nicest, most friendliest people you'll ever want to meet. Um, uh, I'm going to pop through this. So a lot of these slides are actually, these are Tammy's slides. So um, when we talk about hyponatremia, we really talk about two things that can cause this. One of which is people retaining water um, and fluid retention. And then the other thing is people losing sodium. Uh, and, and, and it, you know, if you don't have any sodium, you can drop your sodium that way. Um, and so that's kind of what we tell people. And there's probably a spectrum there where people, you know, if they're drinking something, if they're just drinking pure water and they're sweating a lot, they are going to lose some sodium. And then if they start fluid, retaining fluid, that's also going to drop their sodium. Um, so again, there's sort of this idea of, um, as you guys know, you're all studying for, for boards, uh, SIADH, uh, essentially a lot, it's what a lot of these runners uh, are, are, are happening to them is for some reason, their body goes into an SIADH stat status where um, they're not... Uh, um, 
you know, they're not, uh, their AVP, uh, AVP secretion gets all messed up. And so they're, they're not signaling their kidneys like, hey, we have too much water, start peeing. They start retaining uh, uh, water and they go into hyponatremia. And again, there is some thought as well. We, we don't see this as much at the, at the marathon level, but now we, not, we now are starting to think at the ultra level, there probably is some degree of uh, people need to get some extra sodium in their diet. Um, that's actually that that's actually changed a little bit. Some of Marty Hoffman's research wasn't pointing to that, but some of the more recent research is probably saying getting some extra sodium would help out. Um, and so, you know, what are some of the symptoms these people have? Uh, you know, if they're really retaining water, you know, they're going to say, hey, I feel bloated. My legs are puffy. I'm vomiting. Uh, usually their body weight's going to go up. Uh, again, we might see some runners who get hyponatremic just because they're not getting enough salt. If we could get accurate body weights, those people probably did do have uh, decreased body weight. Um, uh, so um, this sort of talks about some of the things where you can see uh, uh, hyponatremia, and you can really see hyponatremia. Uh, it's going to be uncommon to see it in events less than two hours. Um, but the longer the, the longer the events get, um, or the longer people are out there, uh, the more often you're going to see it. And that's actually what happened at, with marathons is, you know, they re we really didn't see this at the elite level with elite marathoners. You know, the people running two, two hour, two, you know, 230 marathons, we weren't seeing hyponatremia. But where we were really seeing a lot of hyponatremia was in the first time marathoners that it's taking them four, four and a half, five hours. They might not understand um, you know, how much hydration they could take. And frankly, at some of the marathons, I mean, it's good that they have hydration stations, but there's been this like, you know, don't get dehydrated or you're going to die. And so people are chugging, you know, water and Gatorade at every aid station when they really don't need to. Uh, so again, a little bit about the sodium dil dilution, um, you know, the AVP secretion that's happening. Um, and like I said, uh, and so we, we do think that there's a, there's sort of two degrees of, of hyponatremia. There is a hypovolemic where people can get dehydrated. Uh, they drop their sodium, but the much, much more common one is the hypervolemic where people are over drinking, they get the weight gain, um, and, and they have the sodium issues. So if you want to, uh, understand more of this, uh, Dr. Hugh Butler was the, the lead author on this paper. This, these are actually the most recent, uh, guidelines that came out in 2015. Um, if you're going to cover any endurance events, ultra marathons, uh, triathlons, uh, these are great, great, uh, as a great reference. We put this in all of our medical protocols for people to read. Um, one thing I will point out, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get everybody's name on this. Uh, once you guys go out into practice, if I find out any of you guys are opening IV hydration spas, I will hunt you down. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that we really uh, we see these popping up all over the place, and it's my um, it's my pet peeve. I've gotten into so many social media uh, arguments. Um, you know, we see these IV hydration spas opening up; they're really common. Uh, I mean, a lot of them started in Las Vegas um, to help people with hangovers, and then they've kind of been expanding their base and trying to do more to to um, encourage athletes out there. Um, so again, Dr. Hugh Butler and, and, and Dr. Hoffman um, uh, had a, a really good editorial. Um, we, you know, we we get every, pretty much every race I work with gets. Uh, we get these IV hydration spas who want to come to our race and advertise and offer IV hydration to our athletes. Um, and one of the things that we tell them is they don't know what they're doing. Um, and it's potentially, you know, if they have a runner across the finish line and if that runner is borderline hyponatremic and they give them the wrong IV hydration without checking their sodium, without checking their kidney functions, and none of these IV hydration spas check labs on people, um, they can potentially make things worse. So we, you know, we, we tell our athletes, avoid these places. You know, another reason to avoid them is if you're going by, if these are uh, elite runners, uh, WADA makes IV hydration uh, it's, it's, it's a band, it's essentially a band practice. Uh, we actually had a runner, uh, almost get, uh, um, uh, yeah, nailed by WADA last year because she, she went to an IV hydration spot cause she was having a bit of a GI bug. So, uh, avoid these things. Please don't, 
open any of these once you get into practice. Um, and, and I think it's, a, it's really incumbent upon us to try to educate our athletes of why they don't need to do these. We tell people, you know, your GI system works great. Your kidneys are smarter than your brain. You know, orally hydrate, listen to your body, and, and avoid these things. So uh, heat illness, uh, again, there's some debate. If we talk to Marty Hoffman, he's never seen a case of – uh, heat illness at, at marathons, and he's done some things where people have run the entire Western states with an internal heat thermometer uh, that they ingest. Um, we still think about it a lot. I think um, we've had a couple of instances where, uh, you know, th- we've had runners delirious, passing out, um, uh, and unfortunately, we didn't have the right equipment to check a rectal temperature on the time. We we now do. Um, but, you know, when these runners are finishing at 10 o'clock in Auburn, it's hot. Um, and so, you know, we tell people you, it's something you need to think about. Obviously, you know, you guys have heard about heat stroke and heat illness. Um, really, the biggest thing is trying to get these people cooled off as quickly as possible. Um, rhabdo and AKI. Uh, this is a big thing that we see after ultra runs. Uh, it's a spectrum of disease. Um, I always feel this is me and our 4th of July parade in Truckee. Uh, after I marched with my sousaphone for a mile and a half, I'm like, man, I think I got rhabdo. I'm hurting everywhere. But um, rhabdo is really, really common. Um, and this is a slide that we use pretty commonly. You know, someone gets done running a marathon, ultra, you know, half marathon, uh, marathon, ultra marathon, uh, you're going to if you get blood work on them, and I'll show you a data a little bit later here, their CPK levels are going to be elevated. That's kind of normal. Um, you know, what we really try to get across, uh, and, and so a lot of these patients, if they go to the emergency room, if they go to urgent care, you know, they, they get their labs drawn, and, oh, my God, their CPK levels 7,000. We got to admit them. They don't necessarily need to be admitted. Um, the biggest thing is looking at their kidney function, their potassium, their sodium, um, and so uh, and, and really what's going on there. So this is some data. Again, this is um, from Dr. Hoffman uh, and, and his group um, looking at CK levels uh, after Western states. Uh, and they actually did this study in 1995, and then they repeated it in 2010. Um, and interestingly, what, what they're finding is CK levels are going up and up. Um, that they're actually seeing a higher, uh, you know, runners with higher CK levels. So uh, if you look at figure one, you can kind of see the distribution of, you know, CK levels. So, you know, seeing CPK levels of above, you know, 20,000, I mean, we had, they actually had a couple runners that are in above 100,000 uh, for CPK levels after the race um, is relatively common, um, you know, uh, um, so it's not something, and you can see the distribution here between 95 and 2000. So quite a few runners, you know, um, what is this? 25% of people are going to have a CPK level between 10 and 20,000, uh, after the race, 99% of those people don't need to be admitted to the hospital. They're going to do fine. They just need to rest and hydrate uh, and do well. Um, this is some data. So now CPK levels can get bad and CPK levels can cause uh, acute kidney injury. And so, um, uh, we've had at Western States, uh, in 2018, we had the race 2018, 2019, 2020, we took off for, uh, for COVID. And then we had the race in 2021 and in 2018 and 2021, both years, we actually had two runners, uh, admitted both years with um, severe AK, uh, acute kidney injury requiring dialysis. So you know, all of them had uh, incredibly elevated CPK levels, you know, um, but the biggest issues they had, and I don't know how well you can see this, but, you know, serum creatinine levels, the, the lowest one was at 5.9, the highest was at 10, uh, BUN levels all in the in the 90s to 100s. Um, Interestingly, what happens with these runners is they don't necessarily show up in your medical tent at the end of the race. And this is this was one of our teaching points from this. Um, typically, these people get done with the race. They feel fine or they feel miserable because they ran 100 miles. Um, they uh, feel a little achy. They feel nauseous. And um, None of them came to the medical tent immediately after the race. What happens is they go home or in a couple instances, they actually fly home. Uh, and then, a, you know, 
12 to 24 to 36 hours later, they're like, man, I don't feel good. I'm still not peeing. I'm retaining fluid. And then they go into the, into the emergency room and they get these labs done. So we're having a lot of debate. We're actually um, uh, looking at some, we're going to do some research this year to try to figure out, is there some way that we can identify some of these runners who may be at risk of, of, of going into AKI and developing uh, di uh, and needing dialysis? Uh, one thing we do tell our runners is do not take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, naproxen, Toradol. Uh, this is a slide from Bob Weiss, who was the previous medical director at States, uh, and, a, and a, he was a nephrologist. Yeah, he would just describe it as the most dumb, most preventable, most dumb, most stupid thing you can do. Um, now, having said that, a lot of runners take non and do fine. Uh, but when runners do, we just, there was a, recently I was working with the family of a kid who um, uh, just, uh, he finished a race. Um, he was not my patient, so I can talk about him. Uh, yeah, he finished a race, uh, 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 took some anti-inflammatories, uh, and he's just got out of the hospital after having AKI for, for two weeks. Um, he just did his, he actually posted uh, on Strava the other day. He just did his first mile. He walked around for a mile after getting home and he's like, kidneys are important. That was his Strava. That was his, uh, so avoid anti inflammatories. Um, GI issues, uh, we see a lot of nausea and vomiting. If you work in an ultra and someone doesn't puke on your feet, you, you really haven't worked an ultra. Uh, we see a, so we see a lot of nausea and vomiting. It's probably the biggest reason why people drop out of races. Uh, diarrhea is also really, really common. Um, and so a lot of what we do to, with runners at the aid stations is just trying to work with them on what's going to work for them, different eating techniques. Uh, the guy in this photo is uh, Noe Castion, who is an um, uh, incredible ultra runner, just hard, not fast, but just one of the most determined runners. He's also, if you ever uh, needed a crew person, he's he's the guy I would want crewing with me. He's got so much experience. He's got his little tips and tricks, and I don't know if it works, but it's like magic juju science where he has people doing breathing exercises and stuff to try to help out with their nausea and vomiting. Uh, so things that we try to do is we tell people like, hey, maybe slow down a little bit, you know, uh, lower your exertion level. We'll talk a little bit about Zofran and alcohol wipes. Um, so we actually did a study looking at Zofran. Um, it, uh, we called it the two fun study. Um, uh, and what we found was Zofran actually, interestingly, did not help out. There were a lot of flaws. Uh, this was this was the, you know. This was my first attempt at ever doing a randomized uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trial, uh, and trying to do it in the field with ultra runners uh, was uh, – we had a lot of problems with it. So we learned uh, – I, I would say we learned more about how to do a subsequent study than we learned from the study, but uh, interestingly, um, we did not find a lot of benefit with Zofran. Um, uh, in this population. So uh, do we still give it to runners? Yeah. Uh, or do I recommend the runners take it if they're starting to feel nauseous? You know, I don't think there's any harm to it. We didn't see any major downsides to it, but uh, it could be that the mechanism of nausea and vomiting in ultra runners is different than, than how Zofran works. Um, uh, so this is interesting. We started, uh, again, my wife, uh, I didn't mention my wife's an anesthesiologist. And one of the things they do in the operating room when people have post-op nausea and vomiting is they have people sniff uh, alcohol wipes. And there's this is a study looking at uh, post-op nausea and vomiting in runners, or excuse me, in runners, in uh, women who are uh, going G uh, through GYN surgery. And uh, isopropyl alcohol wipes actually work pretty well in reducing post-op nausea and vomiting. So we haven't done a study on this in ultra runners. Uh, but sometimes if they're really having problems, we'll, you know, have them stop by our medical tent. We always have a bunch of medical wipes. We'll be like, hey, sniff one of these and see if it helps out. I think the biggest thing we try to do for runners um, is just give them a variety of things to try. Uh, we have sweet things. Uh, we make uh, one of our aid stations. We make beignets every year. Uh, we tend to have a lot of salty carbs. So we tater tots with salt work fantastic. 
Um, this is my wife at, at, uh, at Tahoe Rim uh, with our, our uh, cornucopia of foods uh, for people to uh, pick. Uh, pickled, pickled juice seems to be a popular one. There's some thoughts that it might help with muscle cramping. Uh, so I think really the biggest thing we try to tell our runners is listen to your body, and if it's telling you to eat something, eat it. Uh, blisters, uh, really, really common. Uh, we see a lot of horrible ones. I hope no one's going to try to eat. I, I will warn you, there's going to be some graphic footage uh, coming up here. Uh, but really, really common um, in some of the multi-day races, we're going to see uh, blisters in about 74% of people, mostly on the toes. Uh, interestingly, in this study, um, taping and powders didn't help. Um, but uh, here are some of our great uh, blister uh, photos. Uh, these are courtesy of uh, John Van Off and Tanya Olson, who I'll mention. I'll show their book in a second. Uh, but big blisters, a lot of maceration with feet, loss of toenails. Uh, these get even worse. Uh, you know, people exfoliating their entire heels, um, bad maceration. Um, I'm actually getting ready uh, uh, next uh, Monday. I'm driving down to Southern California. They're going to have a six-day um, running event uh, where one of the women's going to try to set a world record for how far you can run in six days. And we have 10 women down there that are going to be running. And um, I think from a medical standpoint, I'm knock on wood, I hope things are going to be pretty mellow. The biggest thing I'm actually worried about is, is their feet over six days. So, uh, so we do a lot of blister care. Um, this is me with my blister uh, saber up, uh, up on the top left there. Uh, but this is uh, John Van Off. Um, uh, doing a lot, uh, just trying to get people taped up. Um, so if, if you're, uh, interested in foot care, it's, uh, and it, for me, it's helpful because as someone who runs ultras, I've been learning a lot with this stuff. Um, the book fixing your feet is now in its seventh edition. I will put a plug in for it. Um, John was the original author and Tanya is kind of taking over as John is starting to get near retirement age. Um, we also have a lot of really good uh, uh, photos. Uh, Tanya Olson uh, has done some of those for us. And if you go to the Western States website, which is up at the top, uh, and look for the foot care stuff, uh, Tanya's got a series of videos on there. She's also a really good person to follow on uh, Facebook and, and uh, social media. She just did a talk on foot care, and she's uh, um, to say that she's passionate about it is, a, is an understatement. Uh, musculoskeletal issues, again, really common. We see muscle cramps, IT band syndrome, patellofemoral issues. Um, this, uh, this is a photo of uh, Courtney DeWalter, who's, uh, for those of you who follow ultras, uh, she's the queen of ultras. Her, her running year last year was just, uh, was absolutely amazing. She won Western States, Hard Rock, and UTMB all in the same year, which has never been done. Uh, and she's just one of the nicest, kindest people. Uh, this is her, uh, God, I forget what year this is, but she was coming through our aid station at, um, at about mile 70 of, of Western States. And you could just, I, I got this photo of her and I felt bad because I posted it on social media. And it, she was starting to limp. And if you look at the expression on her face, she has the look that a lot of us do when we know, like, it's not going to be a good day. I can't put weight on this leg. Uh, and she ended up dropping out. I, But it was it was kind of funny on social media. She actually ended up reposting my photo. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, you reposted my photo. And, I, and she was kind of embarrassed. She's like, uh, I wish I should have asked you for – I should have asked you for permission to post my photo. I'm like, well, I should have asked you for permission to post a photo of you, you know. So uh, she's just a great person. But – uh, we see a lot of this uh, fairly common. So, and, and this kind of gives you a sense of uh, where we're at on the, this is the Western States course. I probably should have put this earlier in the slide set. Uh, but this year we were down at Peachstone, which is right around mile 70. So there's a lot of descent uh, that people put on their joints. Uh, so a couple more difficult cases, and then I'm going to leave some time for questions. Um, so we're, again, we're at, this is at Peachstone last year. Um, the guy with the good looking hair uh, is our, he's a good friend of our Steve, uh, Martelli, uh, this is him and my wife at Peachstone last year. I just happened to be down there uh, to kind of check in to see how things are doing. And Steve was kind of complaining of some leg pain. You know, we sort of thought it was an IT band syndrome. And, and with him being a good friend, we tried some things to get him uh, down the trail. 
Um, this aid station is particularly tough to get to. It's about a mile and a half down a pretty rugged dirt road. Um, we allow two or three cars. We only allow two or three cars down there. Uh, so I actually have to park my car at the top and either hike in or bike in to get down there. So I had hiked in there and I was, I saw Steve and I said hi to my wife and I was hiking out of the aid station and on race radio, I got a call, uh, there's a runner down, you know, after Peach Stone who's complaining of severe leg pain. Um, so uh, I'll show the slide in a second. So as medical director, I run back down there. Uh, we figure out it's our friend Steve. We run down um, to go see him. Uh, and he was probably, I think it was, I have to do the math. I think it was about 0.4 miles down the trail. Uh, and he could not move, was screaming in pain. Um, we ended up, uh, uh, my friend, Mike, who was the guy that we put cups on early in the race, Mike is a ski patroller as well. And, and uh, sort of Eagle scout at heart. Mike had some, uh, wooden boards that he was using as tables. So we took apart one of the tables, got a wooden board, got, uh, got him on the, on the wooden board. And we had, and we had about. We took us about took about six of us to get him up. Uh, like I said, it was a little less than a half mile with a couple hundred feet of elevation going up this hill. Uh, got him back to the aid station. Got him in the back of a pickup truck. Went up this incredibly bouncy road. Uh, uh, poor Steve was just screaming the entire time. Never sore, but it was just an incredible pain. Uh, had the ambulance meet us at the cul-de-sac where you could park our cars, took him to the hospital, and then his wife texted me this photo. Uh, these were the x-rays he got um, when he got there. So he had a, a, a spiral uh, femur fracture. We still don't I, – I think what happened with this is he was developing a, a stress fracture. He was just going downhill so much uh, that it turned into a spiral fracture. Uh, we're, we can't, you know, there's still some debate of could he have tripped and done this and we're going back and forth. But um, these are the cases that kind of keep you up at night. Um, the other one that happened at our aid station this is a crazy case. You'll never see this one. Uh, 37-year-old guy actually came to our aid station. He was rocking and rolling, uh, left the aid station and took a, took some ibuprofen because his ankle was hurting him. And he kind of choked on it and just felt this like sort of pop in his chest, started developing really bad right-sided uh, chest pain and dyspnea. Um, he had a pacer with him, a, a safety runner. Safety runner came back. Uh, my wife and I went down. We got him back to the aid station. He was just severe uh, difficulty lying down. Um, we actually initially thought he had a, 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 a pneumo. Um, got him into, again, got him up the hill, got him into it. We called, uh, got, got an ambulance activated, got him to the hospital. Uh, and he ended up uh, having a ruptured esophagus of all things. And this is kind of a hard uh, picture, but, uh, there's, a some gastrographin, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, being let out and you can see he actually has a, a pneumo, uh, mediastinum, uh, on the CT scan, but it actually took the ER probably a good 10 to 12 hours to figure out what was going on with him. Um, we actually wrote this up for one of the medical journals and he had to write his, uh, he had to write a little bio of what was happening. And um, so, yeah, he was basically like, you know, they thought he was having a heart attack. Um, and he kind of didn't think it was that bad until he went and they did when they did the the upper GI. And they they uh, the contrast showed the rupture and the radiologist was like, holy crap. So he had to have a big surgery um, and it took him. Yeah, he was in the hospital for 41 days, three hospitals feeding through a J tube. Uh, but he's back running. Um, this is him. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, uh, this is him last year. Uh, so he came back to the race uh, and finished the race last year uh, at Western States and got his buckle. So, uh, yeah, I still get – sorry, I get choked up seeing them from those photos. <laughs> Uh, and then we've seen a lot of other crazy stuff, gallbladders, rupture of ovarian cysts. Uh, we've had uh, people with seizures, who with known seizure disorders, compartment syndrome. Uh, one of the things I always tell people is you got to have good communication. These are some of our ham radio operators. I now have my ham radio license. So when stuff like this happens, communication is always critical. 
and ultimately, this is why we do these things. Uh, you know, we do it because the just the number of people I've gotten to meet, uh, literally from all over the world. Um, the runner up on the top left, who's in the cot, uh, was actually the first runner from Singapore to do Western States. Uh, just a super nice guy. Uh, we've met runners from, uh, my mother-in-law is Italian. So we make, we, every time the Italian runners come through, we make friends with all the Italian runners. Uh, Juca is down in the bottom, right? Um, he's from, uh, uh, Finland. Uh, and I become friends with him on social media. He was actually back out here, uh, last year at, at uh, covering, helping at a different race. And we got to see each other and give each other a big hug and, it's it to me. It's really the fun part is I've gotten to know so many of these people as runners, as friends, um, and it's it. I think it's important for me to do that because it really uh, we get to know these people and know what kind of keeps them ticking. So uh, that's kind of that's pretty good timing. That's kind of the end of my talk. Uh, this is my wife and I finishing the one hundred mile I did in Havelina, uh, and then the photo down here is our. Uh, that's our view from uh, if, if anybody wanted to join me at uh, Tahoe Rim, uh, we're at the Tunnel Creek Aid Station. And that's our view of uh, Lake Tahoe from our Tunnel Creek Aid Station, which is one of the most gorgeous spots in Tahoe. So we feel lucky to do this. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I would love to take uh, some questions here. We have a couple in the chat. I can read them off to you if you'd like that'd be great all right from Kristen, have you ever heard of or used compazine or prochlorpyrazine yep. for race nausea i was told that it was the only antimetic that increases hypoxic ventilator response and is best for altitude slash endurance gi issues that's a good question we have not used uh, we have not used compazine uh, in part because of some of the side effects for it. Um, some of the mental, you know, they, they actually use uh, compazine um, as like an antipsychotic as well. So in some of our, I, I, we haven't used it uh, because I, we've always kind of been worried a little bit about the side, some of the, the, uh, mental side effects of it. Uh, and that's where we've used Zofran. Um, I think it probably warrants looking at, I mean, it might help out, uh, you know, we, use, again, um, I, I do kind of wonder if the, uh, uh, if the, uh, mechanism of nausea and vomiting, uh, is dependent, uh, is, is very different. And, uh, there's been some studies at Western States that, yeah, it, it, you know, the, the nausea you get might be a little bit different, but it'd be it'd definitely be worth looking at. I have not seen anything about the, the hypoxic ventilator response. I'd have to look into that a little bit, to be honest with you. All right. And then from Valentina, are you looking for students to participate in research? Um, this year, no, we have our research team, but I always tell students, if you guys have the opportunity to, you know, at um, if anybody's out in, in uh, California, for either for Western states or for TRT, we'd love to hook you guys up at working at some of the aid stations. Um, you know, generally what we find is, uh, yeah, you start working at them and, and you know, 95% of the time people are like, oh my God, this is so much fun. If nothing else, it um, it's uh, it, it beats being locked up in a hospital. Um, so uh, yeah, research wise right now, the project that we're working on, we kind of have a, uh, the, the one that we're working with, with this AKI, and I'm actually, I'm not even a, a lead investigator on it. We have a team at UC Davis that's leading it. So I think they're locked in on that stuff. And then from Andrew, is there an ideal formula to hydrate with or what variables would you consider when deciding different options? Great question, Andrew. Uh, and I probably should have had something on that in my talk, but maybe I didn't put it in there so we'd get a great question like this. Um, so uh, one of the things that I, I, we talked about hyponatremia, one of the things I didn't put in there is what is the appropriate treatment for hyponatremia. Um, and so uh, if you look at some of the IV hydration uh, guidelines, if you're working at a ultra race and you have a runner come in 
and they're having, you know, if they're delirious, they're not orient, you know, they're not oriented, they're uh, confused. Um, uh, it, let me give you an example of one of the the first ultra runners I ever had that uh, had hyponatremia. So we had a guy. This was at TRT, probably. Oh God, uh, probably about ten years ago now. Um, and it was, we had a cool year. Um, he had, uh, a couple nights before the race, he had gone out and had, they have a, a, a get together where they have beer available. So he, he was going to have one beer and I think he ended up having two or three beers. Uh, so the next day he was all worried about that. He was dehydrated. So he pounded all this water. And then at the start of the race, he, was pounding a bunch of water and again it was a cool year so he wasn't uh he wasn't uh sweating as much um he got the r8 station at mile 12 and i think for him he was you know probably was he was about three or four hours into the race at that point um and he was he was having a hard time following directions now the thing that we we kind of knew this guy um and he's kind of a quirky guy to begin with um, I remember he took off his shoes and he literally had like four orthotics in his shoe. Um, so, uh, we're like, okay, this dude's a quirky dude to begin with. But, you know, like I remember we gave him something hot to drink and, or we gave him, he was cold. So we gave him something hot to hold on to, to try to warm up to. But we said, don't drink this because this is boiling hot. And he tries to drink and he's like, oh my God, this is so hot. And we're like, yeah, dude, we told you that. Um, we didn't have an eye stat that year. Uh, we sent him out of the aid station, uh, and about three miles later, he was at the top of uh, one of the peaks and was completely delirious. Unfortunately, one of my friends, uh, who was a nurse, was up there, calls me. I went running up with a friend of mine. Uh, we actually had to helicopter him out. It's been the only time I've had to helicopter anybody out of a race. Um, and I remember, like, they were trying to get a urine sample on him. And we gave him a, we were giving him a urine bag to pee into and he kept putting on a, on his head like a hat. So that was the kind of delirium, like he couldn't follow directions. He couldn't follow commands. So if you have a runner like that and you're working at an ultra race, one of the appropriate things to do is, is to say this person's probably hyponatremic. Um, and so really what the treatment for those people are is going to be hypertonic saline. Uh, which brings me back to Andrew's question. So we have uh, 3% hypertonic saline in all of our kits. Um, fortunately, we rarely have to use it, but when you need it, you absolutely need it. Um, and so if you have a runner who's hyponatremic, what we'll do is we'll give them usually about 100 cc bolus. It doesn't take a lot, um, but if they're hyponatremic, you give them 100 cc bolus of hypertonic saline. You can repeat that every two to three minutes for 15 minutes, uh, and you see if the person gets better. And if they get better, chances are they are hyponatremic. If they're not better, then you've got to start thinking of other things. Um, that's if you don't have an ISTAT and you have access to an IV. Uh, if you don't have access to an IV, we give people really, really salty things. So uh, let's say you're, you're there and you have hypertonic saline, but you can't get an IV in the person rip open the bag of hypertonic saline and have that person drink it. Um, I actually encourage people drink hypertonic saline. It's really, if to, to, you know, all these sports drinks that you get, they're like, Oh, we're going to replace your sodium and your, they're all hypotonic to get to nor to get to uh, isotonic fluids. It's really salty. It, you know, uh, and when you taste hypertonic saline or 3%, it's really salty. Um, so, but you can give people, if you don't have uh, hypertonic saline, um, if you look at the, if you look at the literature on, on treating hyponatremia, there's some formulas of, of basically taking like a bouillon cube and putting it in, you know, a, a 10, you know, or 20 cc's of water. So it's again, really salty, have them pound that. Um, so yeah, so when we have runners, you know, so now at Western States at TRT, if we have someone who comes in and they look bad um, and we, you know, there, we really try to avoid IV hydration at all of our races. I mean, most of the, the, the race protocols now, you know, back in, back in, you know, 
10, 15 years ago, you'd go to an Ironman and everybody who finished was getting an IV and there, it was really not necessarily necessary and sometimes maybe harmful. Um, so we've really gotten away from that. We try to tell people, you know, drink to thirst, uh, orally hydrate. Again, your stomach and your kidneys are smarter than any of us are trying to put an IV into people. But if we, if we have someone where we're like, okay, this person's throwing up, they can't keep anything down. Um, and we need to give them an IV. We're going to do an ISTAT on them. That's going to give them a our BUN and creatinine and their sodium levels. And then we're going to use that to judge, you know, what IV fluids we're going to give them. Generally at the race, our, our two options are going to be, they're either going to get uh, hypertonic uh, saline or they're going to get uh, normal saline, you know, 0.9%. Um, you know, if they're in the hospital, you might start to get a little fancier there and throw some D5 and stuff in there. But um, in the field, you know, all these IV fluids cost us money. So we try to keep things simple and just have those two available. And then it looks to be the final question in the chat from Matt. Where can we find information about um, working at the aid stations? Uh, so the best place to do that for my two races is if you go to our websites, there's generally a volunteer section. Um, and so you can click on there and there's, uh, there's an email uh, on there that you can say, hey, you know, I'm interested in working and then we'll get you plugged in, you know, depending on your time commitment and how long you want to be there, we get you plugged in at, like I said, at either of our races, we can always use help. You know, I would also encourage people, um, you know, depending on what part of the country you are and find, you know, there's races everywhere. Um, and so find, you know, reach out to uh, your local races, your local race directors, um, there's some incredible race directors all over uh, and medical directors all over the country, you know, reach out to them and say, Hey, you know, can I work at the finish line? Can I work? Um, I, I will say, I think one of the fun things that, at, uh, at, uh, at Western, well, at Western States and it's, and at TRT, um, is really getting to see the runners on the course and then at the finish line. Um, you know, it's one thing work at the finish line, um, uh, it's one thing working the finish line and see, seeing people finish. Um, uh, but I've had so many experiences where I've seen runners at various aid stations and they're battling. They look like, uh, I, the, the photo I was showing you of Noe, um, they, they changed our TRT course a little bit, but one of the great things about our aid station used to be, we used to see the hundred mile runners six times. And, uh, I remember one of the first years I met Noe, he came through the aid station at mile four, which is about mile 62 at that point. Looked just horrible. I mean, he looked like death warmed over. And I'm like, this dude's done. And we sent him out on this six mile loop um, uh, called Red House. It's just, it's just, it's so, it, I'm glad they got rid of the loop. It was just a dumb, it was miserable. It was just a miserable, unfun loop. We sent him out at Red House and it's like, you know, midnight two o'clock in the morning or whatever he comes back just smiling looking great joking around and i was like what the hell just happened you know so that's kind of the fun thing is is at some of these races depending on the course um i mean finish line's always fun but if you can see the runners during the race see what they're going through help them get through those rough patches and then head to the finish line at the end and see those people finish it's uh uh, it's fantastic. And you, and you really feel like you've, uh, uh, you really feel like you've helped people. So, yeah. All right. Um, well, it looks like it's just about eight o'clock East coast time here. Um, if anyone has a question, uh, you should type it frantically right now. Um, or you're going to miss your opportunity, but, um, I'm going to assume that's all we've got here. So, uh, Dr. Pasternak, thank you so much for, uh, you know, giving us an hour of your time and telling us all those cool stories. Um, I did look up um, while you were talking. I think you're saying there's like a lady who wants to run the farthest distance in six days. I think the current record stands right around like 600 miles, if anyone's curious. Um, is that right, Dr. Pasternak? It's, yeah. it's yeah. Um... Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and she's, um, let me see just really quickly. Um, yeah, so this insane. woman's name is, yeah, so this woman's name, uh, Camille Heron's the, like okay. I said, we're working with all these runners, but Camille's the one that's really going to be, um, 
going for the record and she's uh she's incredible I, I i will say one thing i love about people like camille um and so many of these other runners um well one of the th- there's a lot of i have good friends who are ultra runners and cyclists and endurance cyclists and mountain bikers and cross i, I do a lot of cross-country skiing it's like my sport um one of the things I love about ultra runners is um, the amount of, uh, I, I don't want to stereotype, but triathletes tend to be very OCD in their diet. Not all of them, but it's, they tend to be very, uh, very clean, very, um, you go to a triathlon and I'll see people like Camille or, um, uh, you know, we mentioned Courtney, you know, Courtney's constantly just pounding tacos, pizza, um, you know, I mean, they're just trying to get whatever food that they can into their system. Um, uh, so yeah, she's, uh, and, and Camille's the same way. I've seen Camille, uh, at various races. Um, and yeah, she's just putting down whatever she can. She's one of the nicest, just incredibly nice person. Um, but I think, yeah, she's, uh, yeah, what is uh, – so Camille's back – like I said, we'll see her next next year. But she did um, – yeah, so she set a 48-hour world record doing 270 miles in 48 record. Uh, and Yeah. Um, and I, like I said, I think she's going to go uh, um, – yeah, she's going to go – I think she wants to go over – 600 which is going to be just we'll see what happens yeah it's going to be uh it's going to be an interesting challenge yep yep sounds like an interesting case report maybe hopefully not too interesting i i i i um we'll see what yeah i i think uh if anybody can do it she can do it i mean she's um she knows what she's doing she's done these things uh um, I think she's tried to make some attempts at it before, uh, but um, yeah. So she's. We'll see what happens with her. Yep. Cool. Well. Um, All right. Stay tuned to uh, if anyone's curious. Maybe Gomi will keep you posted on whatever happens with this record attempt here. Um, but anyways, uh, thank you everyone so much for joining us here. Uh, come back in two weeks for our next talk. And uh, Dr. Pasternak, thank you once again. Thanks. And if you guys have any questions or things come up, please reach out to me. Appreciate it. Great. Have a good night, everyone. So I hope